Hello and welcome to another Wisconsin Association for Talented and Gifted podcast. I'm your host once again, Corey Nardon. And today I am very, very excited to bring aboard Dr. Sheila Gallagher. Uh, Dr. Gallagher is an amazing person in gifted education. She has over 30 years in gifted education as a teacher, director of research and assessment, uh, grant manager, et cetera, et cetera. And she has done so much in the gifted education field. So I'm very excited. And also, from a weight take perspective, very happy to bring her aboard because he will also be a keynote speaker in October in the Wisconsin Dells. So, uh, Sheila, first of all, how did you get your start in gifted education? Hi, Corey. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate this opportunity. And let me just say in advance how very excited I am to be coming to Wisconsin in October. Um, my start in gifted education was pretty unique uh, because my father was also in gifted education. Um, people who can remember way back might remember the name of James Gallagher. He was one of the first textbook authors in the field, and he was also influential in many of the landmark times in the field, like the passage of the, of the um, legislation following the Marland Report, and he was involved in creating the Marland Report, which was one of the first seminal reports in the country uh, around the needs of gifted and talented students. So I learned a lot at the dinner table when I was a child and the conversation about gifted kids. So that's one way I got into the field. Then I would also say that really from the time I was a teenager, maybe a college student, there was just something that was fascinating to me about the lives of eminent people and the way they thought differently and the way they saw the world differently that I really wanted to understand and and I wanted to be able to help along, you know, nourish. And so when I actually entered college, well, entered graduate school, my thought was that I was going to be a counseling psychologist for gifted students. And that was the path I wanted to take. But I found out that you couldn't get degrees in that back in the 1980s when I was getting my PhD. So, so that's how I ended up with a degree in education and a couple of years of teaching in um, social studies and language arts classrooms, which was an awful lot of fun. But I learned right away that I really wanted to go further and deeper, which is what took me into my graduate studies. So that was really the start of um, getting this long career going. That's interesting. So take me back to the dinner table back when you were, you know, in younger high school age, maybe when you, the wheels started turning about gifted education. What do you remember were the big hurdles back then about uh, gifted education? Well, you know, that's funny, Corey, because the big hurdles back then are very much the same big hurdles that we're facing today. And I would say, that the two biggest hurdles that we face are misunderstanding of what giftedness is and the whole concept of giftedness. And the second is equity. That has always been a challenge for us in the field and ensuring that we don't um, silo gifted education in some neighborhoods, that it, it becomes ubiquitous and available to all kids in all neighborhoods from all backgrounds. Uh, so when, if you were to go back and read this wonderful historical document, the Marland Report, you'll find that it's filled with information about everything that we knew about culturally, linguistically, and economically diverse students back then, and about how dedicated people were back then to creating equity, which is sort of ironic because we're still working on that so hard today. Wow, that that is interesting. It's it's kind of it's kind of interesting and sad that you know the hurdles are still remain the same. You know, from then to then to now. Yeah, um, you've won, Sheila. You've won. You know, multiple awards. You know, for your problem based learning curriculum. You know, what to kind of boil it down in the nuts and bolts perspective for people that don't really know what that is. What exactly is problem based learning? Ah, well, problem-based learning, it really comes from medical school programs. Uh, problem-based learning was started by medical educators who recognized that 
school learning, even at the graduate level, doesn't look like real world practice at all. And so what they tried to do was to try to train doctors instead of having them reading a textbook and studying everything about an anatomy and then getting a test, they started creating scenarios where doctor or doctor medical students would meet a patient and they'd have to learn how to ask the right questions and do the right things and have the right bedside manner in order to treat the whole person. And so what I've done with this model with my colleagues over the years is we moved that into the K-12 environment. So instead of studying about, I don't know, the, the, the medieval era, we put the kids in a scenario where we say, okay, you're the town leader and there's this disease coming up the boot of Italy and it's the Black Death. So what are you going to do to save your town? Or are you even going to save your town? And so instead of just opening a dry textbook and memorizing everything about the medieval period, the kids are immediately drawn into asking questions. And of course, a child's own questions are always more interesting to them than a textbook questions or a teacher's questions. And so it really gets them into the world of inquiry, of investigating their own questions and learning all the stuff you want them to learn by immersing them into this fantasy of sorts, you know, this deep immersion into what it might be like to be in medieval times facing this dire disease. Wow, that's really interesting. So it's very, so it's really situational. It's very situational. And, you know, it not only draws on the power of inquiry-based learning, but also a lot of what it is to learn through stories, right? So each one of them is its own stories. We have another one where the kids are biologists and they're trying to recover an endangered black-footed ferret, which is a real thing. You know, that's what scientists are doing right now. But the kids have to enter into this, well, what's it like to be a scientist in the field? And what, how do things change when you discover that there are some people who really don't care? You know, like, why should we be saving this back-footed ferret, which is a very legitimate question. And so they have to learn how to do the science, but also do the human part of it and take into account all of these multiple different perspectives. And what this does, it's, it's good for all kids, don't get me wrong, but what it does for a gifted kid is that it puts them into this environment of depth and complexity that they really thrive on. You know, they love these big questions and all the interconnections. And so it's what makes it such a great environment for those kids. And it really forces them to collaborate and work in groups, I would assume, right? Absolutely. They learn right away that you cannot be the expert on everything. And really, part of the whole notion is that they learn how to create pockets of expertise, right? You've got one person who's an expert in the in the biology of ferrets, and you have another group that's really working on relationships between the scientists and the townspeople, and you've got another group that's looking at the environment of the prairie and how does that impact the ferrets. And I mean, obviously, I could go down this ferret hole for a long time. But but yes, that's it. Everybody comes back to the center discussion table with unique information that all has to be shared and they do learn how to rely on one another. That's awesome. And, and as you described it, the first thing that kind of rang true in my ears was when I was a kid, I used to uh, a true your own adventure type story. Mm, yeah. That's kind of what I envisioned in my mind. And choose your own adventure. Okay, we can pick this, and then we'll then this will happen, and then like every there could be a different ending or a lot of different outcomes. I think that's really neat. Absolutely true. Yes, and and the idea that they think you know, of course, we write these scenarios so that the kids ask specific questions, but they think they're in charge, and that is also tremendously empowering. Wow, that is that is really great. Um, what just from a just from another uh, gifted standpoint what how, what strides have we made uh, as uh, nationally would you say just in terms of gifted education advanced learning what strides do you think we've made in the last uh, five to ten years uh, how far have we come 
Well, um, there's a mixed answer to that. I would say that we have certainly taken strides. We're learning more. And again, I have to go back to the whole question of equity as being one of the key issues that we've really been trying to address over the past, uh, well, we'll say 10 years. Um, so I think one of the key things that we have really honed in on is insisting that gifted education become ubiquitous, right? That it should be in every school should have some sort of program for the top 10% of their kids. So that's one way of ensuring that everybody has a chance to learn further than the norm. Um, I think that we have gotten better at thinking about identification and new models of identification. So one of the key methods that we're looking at right now is called universal screening, which is a little self-evident, like every child should be considered for the gifted program as a baseline. But we're also looking at how do you add on to that? foundational level of identification? How do we use multiple methods, um, creativity assessment or portfolio assessment? How do we give kids instruction in the regular classroom that's so engaging that we see abilities pop out in the kids so that it's more of a natural process than a standardized assessment always. So I think we've really come a long way in our identification. And if I could add one more thing to that, I think that we've come a long way in thinking about what the stru structure of the gifted program should be like. And that the gifted program isn't just one thing, but it's really a continuum of services. And I think the analogy that I'd like to draw is like a sports uh, venue, right? Where everybody gets an opportunity to play a sport, say baseball, right? But not everybody is going to be an elite baseball player. That doesn't mean you deny the opportunity to baseball, you know, but everybody has a chance. So there's one layer where a lot of kids have access to something that's a little bit extra. But then there's another layer. There's that travel league for baseball where the kids who are extremely passionate about it and who are extremely skilled about it have an opportunity to work together to be at the next level. And then there's the highest level, like the kids who are going to be playing in college and then maybe becoming professionals. That's a narrower group. And we're going to pay attention to them too, but we're not going to do it at the expense of the kids who just want to have some fun playing baseball. So we're getting better at creating programs and gifted education services that also address that continuum. The idea that a lot of kids need a little something extra, and they should have access to that. And that there are some kids who need even more than that, and they need time to be in self-contained environments for part of the school day where they can learn from each other and push each other, and they've got a teacher who's qualified. And then uh, there's this third level, these kids, you know, we sometimes call them the severely and profoundly gifted, who are so gifted that they need a unique environment altogether. But it's not just one of those things. It's all of those things working in a system that really creates a good gifted program. And I think we've come a long way in sort of recognizing that and figuring out how to structure that. That baseball analogy, Sheila, is, is amazing. Uh, I've heard from so many people about how, you know, why, you know, a lot of parents and other people send you know, their kids off to have, you know, elite coaching and we have top, you know, like you mentioned, travel teams, all this other stuff for sports. Why do we have such a hard time with academics? Uh, Appetite, and, yep. uh, education. And I, I thought the same thing. I'm, I'm just like, why aren't there quote unquote travel leagues for <laughs> academics? Yes. Like, why the physics. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know, like why, I guess, why, why is academics on the outside looking at, I, I guess I'd, I've never really thought about that, but that's a good point. Like why, why is it more or less frowned upon for uh, athletics and even band to a certain extent, uh, mm -hmm. you know, other extracurriculars to be, to have, you know, a, a narrow elite uh, circle as opposed to uh, gift education. I'm not, I've never understood why that is. Yeah. And I, th I think that, 
part of it is because historically, you know, the programs have been these iron walls where some kids are anointed, gifted, you know, when they're very young and that never changes and nobody else ever gets to enter into that magic kingdom. And as I said, you know, I think we have really learned a lot about being more flexible and more permeable. We really don't believe in hardline academic tracking. We really believe in flexible grouping and lots of opportunities of different sorts for different kids. You know, and I think that the more we lean into that and say, yes, you need a program for those kids who are at the top and they need to be together and they need a qualified teacher, absolutely. But that doesn't mean we don't do anything for other kids. And if I can just add one thing, it also it starts, the foundation of a good gifted program is respectful, engaging education in the regular classroom, right? It's not that the gifted kids go on all the field trips and the gifted kids get all the fun stuff and everybody else is sitting in rows listening to a teacher lecture, right? We need a really good, rich, dynamic, regular classroom so we can see the talents and abilities emerge that help us understand who needs a little bit more, who could be pushed a little bit. And then in the gifted program, it should be I mean, it'd be great for it to be fun and engaging and all that, but it should be harder. It should be challenging. And that's the invitation you get by identification into the gifted program, not elite status and not a field trip, but a challenge at your level so that you're being pushed further. I agree. It, it needs to be, it needs to be work and it needs to matter. Yes. Um, because if it's, if it's just the, uh, you know, field trips and going places, is it really, um, is it really going to be worth that much from the kid's perspective? Maybe, uh, because a lot of kids are going to want to go places, but I'm not, that, that's the point too. I, I'm not really sure. Like what's, what's the value from the kid's perspective? Well, yes. And, and the truth is everybody should be going places and experiencing things. That's not something to be reserved for the gifted. Now, maybe where you go might differ, right? So, so that, you know, some kids, might be going to one kind of museum and, and other kids might be going to another kind. So that could be differentiated, but everybody should be hands-on and everybody should be going and experiencing. Um, and I think historically, again, that one of the problems with gifted education was that the gifted kids did the fun stuff and other kids didn't. And that's just no good. That's interesting. Uh, so Sheila, why, why is it there been such a difficult, um, why has it been so hard for gifted education to kind of grasp onto certain communities, especially, you know, rural communities that, you know, still, uh, they don't want to either a spend the money or, you know, give resources to gifted education, even though, you know, like you mentioned, you know, universal screening should, be, I'm surprised that it still hasn't been, um, you know, kind of grasped on everywhere. Um, why, why is there still pockets of the nation that still don't, firmly believe or grasp that gift education really matters? Well, I'm going to start my answer to that question at a really high level, Corey, which is that in teacher preparation programs, there is no requirement for a teacher to learn anything about gifted education. There's no requirement for an administrator to learn anything about gifted education. And because of this, myths and misconceptions continue to flourish. So one of the biggest reasons why I think that there are no services in like rural areas or in certain neighborhoods is because people don't really understand what they're looking for and what we're trying to achieve in gifted education. And without that universal educator preparation, I think we're always going to be fighting an uphill battle. So that's the first piece. I think another piece is that, you know, when you think about a rural area and you look at that gifted child, you're looking at, you know, one in a thousand. And that may mean just one child. And it's just that much harder to dedicate services to an individual child. I, I think we're very fortunate to be living in an internet age where for kids in rural areas, at least there are opportunities outside of their geographic boundaries to get advanced services online. Um, but, it, but it also needs to be tailored in different ways, I think, in different regions of the country. And that can also be challenging. Wow. Okay. That's interesting. That's, that's a really good point. Especially from what I've heard from dating back to the, 
uh, the COVID, the pandemic in 2020, mm. um, you know, just the differences in, you know, like a simple thing, like, you know, we take our broadband internet connection for, you know, for granted, you know, we go way out in the country and, you know, their internet signal is obviously not as good, you know, just those kind of things mm-hmm. are, you know, just huge, huge discrepancies. Um, you know, all of your experiences, uh, Sheila, um, tell me one uh, or a couple things that really, you know, put a smile on your face that you knew that you really did act in, in a kid's life. <laughs> okay. Uh, every summer, I have the great honor of working directly with gifted students at a place called Camp Unasa. Uh, it's a program run by the uh, Institute for Educational Advancement, and we have two one-week programs every summer for highly gifted kids. And so I get to work with gifted kids sort of age 10 to 16. And and we work on all aspects of self. You know, we recognize that these kids all have an amazing intellectual self, but we also really focus on their physical selves and their social selves and their emotional selves and their spiritual selves and really help them expand their awareness to, to the whole opportunity that the world provides them. So I get to do a lot of music with them and I do some artwork with them and we all do some guided meditation to help them develop their sense of personal agency and sense of belongingness. And every summer that is a completely magical experience where you get to see kids really make friends for the first time, some of them. I mean, we talk about rural kids, right? And kids who are the only kid in their school who think like them, like they have that opportunity for um, emotional friendship bonding, uh, developing those relationships. This is the place where they come to feel okay about themselves for a week every summer. That always brings a smile to my face. Wow. That is really, really cool. And, 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 I've heard this so many times for all of the uh, gifted education for a lot, so many gifted educators that have told me that the one thing that kind of gets overlooked uh, for kids is uh, SEL, their social emotional yep. learning. Um, and and uh, programs like these are absolutely huge. And, and I'm, I'm surprised that there has been more inroads, uh, at least from the school's perspective, to try to uh, bridge that SEL gap. Yes, I absolutely agree that that's a critical need. Um, We do a better job with the intellectual side of a gifted child's life than the social and emotional side. And and the fact of the matter is this brain is like this huge interconnected network and one thing impacts the other. Uh, When a child thinks differently, they are in a different place than their age group is. And um, they really seek connectedness. In fact, I asked them, I... I don't know if you knew this, but I'm going to become president of the National Association for Gifted Children and later at the beginning of September. And so I asked the UNASA kids this summer when I was there, I was like, okay, what should we be working on? And they said, we need to be connected. That's what we need to be working on. We need people to understand that it's more than just our brain. That's what you need to be working on. So I hope to take that really seriously. That's awesome. And I did not know that. And Congratulations! That's uh, well deserved honor. Another uh, another huge accomplishment in your huge accom- huge and incredible career. So thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time, uh, Dr. Sheila Gallagher, to spend some time with me on the Waytag podcast. And we're and like I said, we're really looking forward to coming to Wisconsin Dells in October. October is a really good time in Wisconsin. Uh, the the leaves are turning. It's not super cold yet, so um, uh, it's it's uh, it's going to be a really really nice time to talk about gift education in the Dells. So that's terrific, Corey. Thank you so much. And as I said, I can't wait to see everybody in October. Appreciate it.